Hi guys, sorry we had a bit of a glitch with the software, but that's uh, I can see people are joining now, so we'll get started with uh, this evening's live. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, I hope so. Cool. Okay. Um, okay. So my name is Duncan. I'm the CEO uh, and head of technology at Candle Shack. Uh, so I'll be taking this live this evening. Um, and as you can see from the title, the title is transitioning from candle development to production. Okay. So. What do we mean by this? Um, a little bit of uh, sucking eggs here for a second. Uh, hopefully you'll forgive me. Um, so there's three main business activities that all businesses do. Uh, first one's marketing and sales, uh, where you guys really hopefully should be focusing most of your time. Um, and that's just really making sure that you understand who your customers are, what it is they want from your products or services, build some brand awareness, tell your story, create a bit of demand and generate some sales, uh, hopefully. The second thing you have to do as a business is you have to have you know, a good product portfolio, whether that's products or services. Um, and, you know, so once you've identified who your target market is, um, you create products and services that, you know, they'll they'll want to buy uh, more than once, hopefully. Um, and the product should do two things. It should offer value. And by that, I mean the functional and aesthetic parts, the product versus the cost uh, should be, should, should inherently have some value to it. And the product should be safe, particularly if you're making this type of product. And then the third thing all businesses have to do is, you know, call it production operations or supply chain management, is actually deliver on that promise consistently every time. And the aim of tonight's live really is to talk through this third piece, which is, you know, once you actually start a business, you've 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 identified who your what your customers look like, what they want, you've you've come up with some great product ideas. This final piece. Um, actually delivering the promise, doing productions and operation. That's what this live is all about this evening. So hopefully you'll find it interesting. So a question really is, have you ever made a batch of candles with the wrong wax or put the wrong amount of fragrance in them? Have you actually put the wrong fragrance into a batch of candles? I know I've done that more than once, uh, quite frustrating. Um, and as you get a little bit more established, you start making products and, you know, instinctively you start to think whether it's your diffusers, your candles or something else, you know, something seems to be a lot of effort for not a lot of reward. But so you ever not sure about what sort of profit you're making on products? Have you had a problem? Hopefully not. This one, this one gets a bit more serious. Have you have a problem with a batch of products um, and then you're not able to identify the other products that were in that batch? Have you ever gone to make an order only to find that the wicks you needed for that order aren't there. Um, you've used them in testing, you've dropped a glass. Uh, again, really common. Have you ever ordered too much of something or not enough? Um, and particularly if you order too much, you've just got all your cash sat on your shelves rather than in your bank account. Uh, and then have you forgot to order a component and then had to pay extra for shipping? I know we've done this a number of times where we've had to fly pallets of stuff in from China because uh, we, we we didn't order it on time or we, we missed something off of the order. It can be really frustrating. And the key message I want to get across tonight really is that if you have done any of these things, don't panic. You're not alone um, because running a manufacturing business is extremely complicated, irrespective of how big or small your business is. Um, <clears throat> it's actually a really complicated thing. So I'm going to take you through a little journey um, just to show you how complicated it is, because I think. When you run a craft business, quite often you can be a little bit unforgiving on yourself, um, you know, thinking. Why do I keep making these mistakes? Uh, why is this happening? And, you know, most of your businesses, uh, if you've got to that stage yet, is you. Uh, and if you're lucky, you might have a couple of helping hands. Um, but when I actually just walk you through what you're actually doing in your little business or medium-sized business, it'll start to make more sense, hopefully. So you've made some candles and you've started to sell them. So hopefully you'll be providing sales orders through your accounting package or just a little Excel template. And those candles, you're gonna you're gonna make some, you're gonna put them on the shelf, and you're gonna you're gonna fulfill sales orders. But what if you don't have enough candles to sell? So bear with me. I'm gonna walk you through this. This is just a little bit monkey see, monkey do, but you get the idea. Um, well, that's easy, isn't it? Because you just if you need more candles, you just go make some more. So you'll do some production. But what do you actually need to do production? How does it happen if you think about it? And how do you do it in a controlled manner? So you need the recipe, uh, and we would refer to this within you know, a larger company as a bill of materials, uh, which is effectively, um, it is, it's the formulation, it's the recipe, and all of the components you require to make your products. 
Um, and you would usually use a thing called a work sorter, which is just a piece of you know, bit of paper that you take into your workshop with you and it has all the details of what you're going to make and how much oil you need, how much wax you need, that kind of stuff. And then you obviously need the raw materials as well to produce the work order. So to do a production run, you need these two things, okay? You need some sort of recipe and then you need the ingredients. Not that different to cooking your dinner, I guess. But where do the raw materials come from? Okay, so the raw materials are going to come from stock. So hopefully, uh, whether it's in your kitchen, your garage, or a little incubator or a, or a business workshop, you've got some shelving somewhere uh, and you've got some raw materials on there. And hopefully, and certainly as you get a little bit bigger as a business, this idea of having minimum and maximum levels at all times is really useful uh, in making sure that when you have a production run, the raw materials are there and waiting. And this is where things can start to go wrong a little bit because, you know, as candle makers, we're forever tinkering. Um, sometimes you break stuff. Sometimes you plan to use 10 of something, but you end up you end up making a bit more or a bit less. So keeping track of how much raw material you've got in stock can be a bit of a burden, uh, particularly when you're starting out and you don't have good systems in place. So there's the question. What if you don't have enough stock? Well, that's easy, right? Because, oh, look, you're just going to go and order some from Candle Chef or from your other suppliers. Um, and to do this, I mean, we would call it a purchase order. So when you're placing orders with your suppliers, hopefully you're printing those orders out or saving them somewhere. And maybe you've got them in a folder uh, by your front door or by the, the kind of entryway to your, um, or the goods in, if you've got a little business unit. And then when the deliveries come, you can, you've got a purchase order to check them against. Um, so you need a purchase order, okay? But before you place your purchase orders, how do you know how much to buy? Um, some people are super organized and they've got it all in their heads. Um, but ultimately, when you go and place an order, it's a bit like going to the supermarket, isn't it? Do you, do you have a shopping list? Are you an organized person or do you just get carried away like most of us do and just add loads of random stuff into your basket, get home and realize you can't cook anything? Uh, it's not that different for running a business, really. Is how do you actually know when you go to your supplier's website to order stuff, what it is you're going to buy? And, you know, one of the things I put out at the beginning is, we all do it. We still do it as a business where we place an order with a supplier and it takes a week or something to arrive or in some cases for us, two or three months. And you realize, damn it, we should have actually ordered this other thing because that kind of hit our minimum level, you know, four days after we placed the purchase order. So, you know, how do you know how much to buy? OK, so that's what we would call purchase planning. Um, and purchase planning really, in part at least, is driven by these minimum and maximum stock holdings. So if you've got your shelves and you've got, let's say you make 30 CL amber candles, you might say, for example, I always want to have at least 50 glasses on the shelf. And if I do, you know, a production run that makes that number drop below 50, so now I've got 40 glasses, that should trigger some action, which is to go and order some more glasses to make sure you've got at least 50 again. Okay, so... We could set minimum and maximum levels on our raw materials, and then we can keep track of what's on the shelf and always have at least a certain amount. But shock horror, there's more complexity, right? Because you've got these things, the orange bit, the work order. You also need, not only do you need to factor in what's on the shelf, but you need to factor in what work orders you've got planned uh, for the next week, for the next month. Um, otherwise, you'll go ahead and you'll order your stock to get your min max levels back up. And the very next day, you'll go and produce the work orders that were planned and your raw material will drop into the minimum again. So you also need to factor in production planning. And this, this, this get, you do this already, okay? So irrespective of whether you're just starting out, if you're running a business, you're already doing all of this. Um, but the likelihood is that at least some parts of this, you're probably trying to do in your head or on some sort of combination of spreadsheets. And it can be very difficult to keep track of all this stuff. And guess what? It gets even more complicated. So how do you know when work orders need to be scheduled? So in a larger business, that would be because you would have forecasts from your customers. So within our contract business, we don't always succeed, but we try to get forecasts from our customers so that we kind of understand you know, how many products we need to meet the sales orders. Um, and then that way we can put the production planning into place, which will generate the work orders. And by having the work orders, that will place demand on our systems which will mean that that will drive our purchase planning, which drives our purchase orders, and then it all kind of cascades back up the right-hand side. So 
That's what the final model looks like. And that's how all manufacturing businesses run. Now, if there's anyone who runs manufacturing businesses uh, who's looking at this and thinking, that's partially correct, you're right, because there's a whole ton of stuff missing out of here. I haven't got things like machine costing. There's, there's, there's much more layers of complexity you can put on this. But at a very high level, this is how it works. Okay, you've got sales orders and ideally a forecast. You do production planning, which generates work orders. You do purchase planning, which generates purchase orders, and then all the other stuff's just activity or materials. So that's how that's how this works. So as you can see, it's not particularly simple. So how on earth do you, as a you know a one or a two person business, how do you keep track of all of this? Well, big companies do it with software called ERP and MRP systems. So there's some examples there. So SAP, uh, Microsoft Dynamics. You've probably heard of these, or if you've had if you've had jobs in corporate, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize some of these brands, Cisco, Oracle, Epicor. And these, these companies essentially provide software that does all of that and usually much more. Um, so what do you need as a small business? One thing I should point out is these, these are terrifying applications. Um, these, these are really for businesses that are generating millions of pounds in revenue because the cost of software like this is, is easily six figures. Uh, and sometimes more. So in our business, for example, we've probably invested, well, significantly more than £100,000 in our ERP system. And, you know, bigger businesses, big manufacturing businesses, I suspect things like SAP, maybe not business one, but the bigger ones and, and some of the Oracle applications can probably run into more than a million pounds of you know cost for these sorts of things. So this is this is very, very serious software and it's not, not really required. So for, for a small business, um, which which most most of us and most of you are. Um, there's probably five or six things that you was five things definitely you want to keep track of in your business that will just make your life easier. So the first one is your bombs, okay, your recipes, which is nothing more than a breakdown of what goes into a product. So that every time you make the product, you make it exactly the same way, okay. And that's what this says there to ensure consistency. Uh, the second thing is some mechanism for planning your work orders and controlling them. Um, so again, this could just be a spreadsheet, uh, or it could be one of the tools that we'll come on to in a second, but, you know, having some sort of planning in place to make sure that not only do you have a bill of materials, uh, but you're creating work orders that are effectively copies of that bill of materials. By having the work orders planned, that puts demand on your system. Um, so that will enable you to, you know, place purchase orders when you need to, which will save you money because if you're... If you can get to the point where you're ordering every week, every month, every fortnight, whatever is a sensible mechanism for you, and you're not missing stuff off your order, then you don't have to pay excess shipping. You can buy in bulk and all that kind of stuff. So you can you can get higher MOQs, better frequency. And when it comes to purchase order planning, the decision you need to make for each material that you hold is what we would call JIT versus JIC. And JIT means just in time, okay? So... I don't know if you um, if you use something that you can get from Tesco's, for example, um, and it's always in stock and it's around the corner from your house, then you can use what's called just in time purchasing. So you don't really need to hold very much in stock at all because, you know, you can always get it. You know, you can get it from around the corner or your supplier's got a one to two day delivery time. So you don't need to hold a lot of it. JIC, just in case, um, safety stock, call it what you want. You would really use that when the supply chain is volatile, okay? So if something is sold out quite often um, or it's something that has a large MOQ, comes from abroad, for example. So if you were to buy, I don't know, printed rigid boxes from China and it takes 90 days to get them, then usually you wouldn't try to run that on a just-in-time model as in wait till you're on your last box when the next delivery arrives because if anything at all goes wrong, you're going to be stranded with no stock for weeks. And even in a business like ours, this is a real challenge because ideally you would just want to have lots of just-in-case stock, okay? You'd like to have shelf loads of stock, but stock is cash. Um, and in small businesses, cash is king. So you can't always afford to have everything just in case. So you should really just choose the lines that you, you absolutely can't get anywhere else and that you just have to have it, okay? Um, and try to have as reliable a supplier as you can. And, and we try to be, but we, we don't always get it 100% right, of course, because again, we're trying to support lots of businesses and sometimes the demand piece can be quite unpredictable. 
Okay, so purchase order planning, try to plan that, and that could be just as simple as setting minimum order quantity. So you always buy a kilo of oil, you always buy 50 glasses, whatever it is to try and keep your ordering under control. Uh, production control is, you know, it's using your work order. It's trying to reduce errors. It's trying to keep costs under control. Um, certainly things like batch numbering and stuff would come into there. And then inventory control is the stuff on the shelves, okay? So what's your minimum and maximum levels? Are you doing cycle counts? If you're taking wax and wax to run burn tests and development, are you are you deducting it from your, from your system, whatever that system is? Okay, so these are the five things I would say that for a small business that are still essential. And some of the other stuff is superfluous, but these five things here within uh, manufacturing control, not so much sales focus, but very much on delivering the promise. These are the five things that that you kind of need. Okay, so the bill of materials, um, it is just your approved recipe for the product. So if you're using Candle Shack recipes, just print one out as a start point. Um, you can put it into Excel, or as you can see in the screen here, this is kind of an example, which I'll come on to in a minute. So you can see the wee box that says the materials used. So that's a description of the ingredients required to make um, one of these um, one of these products. So the example on screen is a 20 centiliter amber candle made with croissant fragrance. Um, you can see the unit cost uh, with this little system is £4.12 per piece. Um, this particular person has said we always want to have at least six pieces in stock. It has an SKU, it has a, a retail price, a wholesale price. So this is just useful information to have in a bill of materials. Uh, as well as the kind of components that would go in there. And again, you, you, if you're if you're a diehard, you can have this on a post-it or in your head. Um, you can have it in Excel or as I'll come on to in a second, there are some systems that will do this stuff for you so that you can focus on the more exciting stuff. The second thing, uh, production planning. So scheduling your work orders. Um, and when you schedule work orders, you're doing it for, there's two places that demand can come from. One is, you know, you've got a reasonable understanding of what you're going to sell. So if you've been selling on Etsy and you always sell about 10 or 20 candles a week, you know, and you say, well, I always want to have at least two weeks worth of stock on the shelves, then you know that you should try to maintain 20 candles on your shelf, um, which would be your kind of minimum stock holdings. And then if you had, you know, a local, I don't know, visitor center came to you for a custom job, says we want, you know, 50 candles specifically for our garden center, you would add in your minimum stock plus any you know specific customer sales orders and then you could you could plan these production runs so in this system here you can see for example there's some planned production uh, which was tomorrow actually uh, there's no production in process in progress sorry and there's some history as well so this is the sort of thing you would think about in production planning and the reason you want to do this is because if you've got production planning in place then those bills of materials, those work orders will put demand on the system so that the next time you go to place a purchase order, the system knows you've got some stuff coming up, buddy. You need to order this much wax, this much fragrance, and it will automatically do that for you. So that's that's what a production planning tool will do. Uh, the third piece, um, purchase planning. So this, this is sequential. Um, so first of all, how much stuff am I gonna sell? What work orders do I need to do? And then your purchase planning, if you get this right, it's probably one of the core areas in your business. If you're a product business, this is really supply chain management, and it's the one area that can really have a huge impact on your business if you get good at it. And the reason for that is you can save quite a lot of money by you know, ordering just what you need when you need it. Um, and you're really, this is what I spoke about earlier, you know, balancing just in time versus just in case. And if you look again at this little example from, you know, there's, this is like a work order pick list up here. So you can say to, in order to create these products, you have to go pick that stuff. And a good system will tell you what you have in stock and where there are gaps. So if you've got your, you know, your production planning done, it drives your purchase planning. Um, and you can see here at the bottom where it says all materials, you know, in this little system, you've got minimum level, which is, you know, I, I, I always want to have at least 115 millimeter wick pads in stock. And my stock level at the moment is 997, so that's black. And if you come down a row, you know, it's saying minimum level 12, but I've only got three. So again, with this little system, you can, it's very visual, um, you know, what you're missing and what you need to order. So purchase planning is something that, you know, I think irrespective of the size of your business, you're doing it already. Um, but again, having a system makes it easier. 
Now, production, um, being able to capture the actual costs, really important. Um, and then one question we see quite a lot in the group is around batch numbers and batch tracking. So again, if you were to use a little piece of software that says, look, create a new batch. So we're saying look, we need five of these um, and it's telling you what materials you need to make the product and also what's in stock. But the other thing in this particular piece of software, for example, is where it's got the fragrance, so buttery croissant, for example, what you can do there is when you've ordered it, if you've recorded the batch number when the, the fragrance arrives, you can actually either select or actually type in there the batch number. So if you've got buttery croissant and the batch number is one, two, three, four, five, six, you can actually put the batch number of your fragrance oil into this product and then that creates a cross-reference so that batch number 10005 of this product was made using a particular batch of wet, a particular batch of wax. And that's awesome, right? Because what that means is if you do have a problem, and we've all been there, right? So uh, I think we had one before where, I can't remember, I think we put a, a, there was an LX8 instead of an LX18 into a candle or something crazy. And having a batch number so that you could actually go and find the other candles that were produced in the same work order is just extraordinarily useful. So if you've got a bad batch of fragrance, you've made a batch of candles and you've put the wrong oil in, this batch numbering stuff, both at the product level and then ideally, if you can, of the raw materials that go into the production can really save your skin. Um, there's nothing worse than if you've done the biggest order you've ever done for a client or something. Um, and you did that production over five days and on day four, you made a mistake, but day one, two, three, and five were perfect. Um, the last thing you want to be doing is bringing back five days worth of production to find, to fix a problem when actually, if you just put back, if you just created batches, uh, you would have said it's only batch three that's affected. So you send me all the ones back that have batch three, one double zero three on them or whatever. And then you've only got 20% of the rework to do. So you know, production control, uh, it's about making sure that when you do a production run, it costs you what you think it was going to cost you. Uh, you've got some me mechanism for inbuilt traceability. Um, and it, it kind of keeps control over, you know, all the materials. So that's the fourth thing uh, is production. And then the last piece, again, really, really important as you're growing your business is the actual control of inventory. So being able to look at a system, whether it's a spreadsheet, a notepad, or a piece of software to say, at the moment, I've got £976 worth of inventory in stock. Really useful. Being able to see when did I buy that stock? Is any of it aging? Um, also some history. Okay, so again, with some of these systems, you can see here, you get the history tabs um, where it shows you, you know, you've got a certain amount of something in stock. And it actually has an audit trail where it says, you know, five days ago, you used three. Um, you know, a thousand pieces were added into stock. You've used three, so therefore you now have nine hundred ninety-seven in stock. And if there was further transactions, it just it just forms a tree. So that's really useful. And then this is really smart. So, you know, as we do, we do this in our business too, is we we do an awful lot of burn tests in our laboratory. So we're forever using glasses, wax, wicks, and fragrance, which means that reduces the amount that's available for people to purchase on our website. So that all needs to join up. Um, so if we take um, you know, product testing as an example, how many people actually do that, right? So if you go off and test some products, do you deduct them from your spreadsheets, from your systems, or do you just take a chance, um, which is, I think, what most people do in the early days and either end up just carrying loads too much stock um, or or they just end up placing multiple orders. So inventory, con inventory control, you know, keeping track of where your materials are going, what the value you've got in stock is, and then can doing stock checks, having some mechanism to be able to say, I should have 23 glasses uh, and you go do a stock check and you find you've actually got 20 or hopefully more. Um, and as you get bigger as a business and you start employing people, that becomes quite important too, because, you know, particularly not so much in our business, but in your business, if you've got nice products, um, you know, finished products, it's always possible that they can go out the back door. Um, so again, just, you know, like any store, like any shop, like any department store, being able to reconcile how much stock you've made, how much should be on the shelf, both finished goods and raw materials, and then periodically checking that to make sure that it balances is just good business practice. So there are the five areas um, that, that I think are really essential, uh, irrespective of your scale. And so the options are 
Uh, you can do it in your head or on paper. Some people are awesome at this. I mean, this, we've got people in our business like um, you know, like Maya is probably one of them. She'll be embarrassed for me to say, and some other people who are just super organized who can deal with lots of um, you know project, real good project managers who can manage stuff. And for them, you know, maybe you can do it in their head. Maybe you can do it in notepads. Just super organized. Um, I can't. I'm a disaster. So I think that for me would be extremely stressful. But that's how most of us start. Okay, when we start our business, it's just a bit of a free for all and everything's in your head. So that's not a good option. A proper ERP or MRP, ridiculous. Okay, unless you're running a business that's generating many millions of pounds in revenue, don't even consider this. Um, you could go down the rabbit hole and start looking at ERPs and MRPs. And I'm talking specifically here about things like SAP and Orberwise and Epicor, these are big beasts that are, it takes more than one person to run these systems, actually. So we've got, you know, I think probably 20 or 30 licenses in our business for people who, you know, simultaneously use these software applications. So you, you can't use these systems with a one, two, three or five people business. They're just not viable. It's not the right solution. So unless you really are scaling and you're internationalizing, you're selling much more than a million pounds worth of products, this, this one's not relevant. Uh, there are some off-the-shelf apps and automations um, that, you know, so I'm talking here about generic tools that can be quite useful, okay? Um, and if you're technically a very competent person, um, and I mean digitally and things like Microsoft Office Suite, it's possible um, to, to use these, which means you don't have any, you know, ongoing costs. So things like Microsoft Office um, with Power Tools, in particular in Power Automate, um, where you can create flows and all that kind of stuff. You can definitely do this sort of stuff within an application like that. Google has similar tools. And then if you're not a programmer, but you understand how applications work, you know, things like Caspio and Zoho Creator, which are what you would call low code environments. It's also possible to create something really bespoke. Uh, and we've tinkered with these in the past. They're very good, but you do need to be quite technically competent. And the other thing is it takes a long time. Um, you know, so unless you're super slick, um, you're going to be spending more time faffing around building an app to manage your inventory than marketing and selling your products, which, which in my view at least is probably the wrong way around. So that's an option. And then the final option really is what, what I'm going to call a mini ERP. So ERP means enterprise resource and planning platform software. MRP is very similar, which just is manufacturing. And there's a bunch of tools out there. Um, so you've got things like Bright Peril and Unleashed. Okay, so these are inventory management type software systems that that quite often link into accounting packages, certainly Unleashed does. So if you use zero accounting software, for example, Unleashed is like an add-on uh, that enables you to add bills of materials. They can be multi-layer bills of materials. You can do sales. You can create manufacturing runs. You can run inventory checks. Quite complicated, both of those are quite big pieces of kit. And then you've got software like CraftyBase and, you know, our favorite, which is Inventora. So Inventora, um, Diana and Jeremy, who are a couple who are based in North America, uh, Diana used to run a, a, and still does, I think, a, a candle business, a home fragrance business, and got frustrated with all of the stuff that I've been talking about this evening. So what she did was her husband, Jeremy, is a software developer, or is he very technical? And they set a company up called Inventora that effectively helped Diana to run her home fragrance business uh, and take care of all this stuff in the background. Um, it's beautiful. It's got a really simple interface. Crafty Base is a competing product in North America, a bit clunk, I think a bit clunkier, much bigger, more in depth, really quite complicated. Um, so Inventora, I think, is a fantastic uh, option. And the good news is, uh, that I've been kind of delaying and getting to. So all of the little clips I showed you throughout this where you could see things like the bill of material, the production planning, uh, we've actually partnered up with Inventora um, and we've got you guys a bit of a deal. Oh, spoiled it, spoiled it. So you can get a 20% um, discount off of their software and it's already not particularly expensive. So it's it's extremely affordable, uh, this software. Um and it does all of the stuff I've just spoke about. Um, you know, it will keep track of your inventory and materials. It will enable you to plan productions. It takes care of your purchase planning. You can do stock checks. It's got lots of reporting in there, how much stuff you've sold, how much stuff you've made. Um, so Inventora is that application. So in summary, 
getting some sort of control in your business as you move from kind of developing products to selling them and running a business so that you can consistently deliver a good quality product to your customer, this control is absolutely essential. If you don't have control, you can still run a business, but you will probably make very little profit because you'll tie all of your cash up and you'll probably be quite wasteful. Big companies use ERP and MRP systems. Don't bother unless you're huge, they're not viable. Uh, so we recommend Inventora as an app, okay? Um, the next live we've got, which I think is next week, we're quite fortunate. We're going to have Delmuth, who works for Inventora, who's going to come on, and she's going to do a demonstration of the software. So anyone who's interested in this software, there's a free version, I should say. So there's a version that's completely free, um, and the only thing it will be missing is some of the reporting is missing, and the ability to do batch tracking is not in the free version. Uh, there's a paid version, which which from memory, I think is about $15 a month, so not a huge amount. And you also get a discount from Candle Sh as a Candle Shack customer. So again, I suspect that will probably cost you somewhere in the region of £10 a month or something like that for the full system. Uh, so extremely reasonable. Um, and there will be a demonstration on next week's live on how to actually use this uh, software. We've also gone ahead and provided, uh, produced some CSV, some Excel imports. Um, so it's at Monday at 7 p.m. This next live will be. So get that one in your diary. Don't miss it. Um, and what we've done is we've created some data imports that have all the vast majority of Candle Shack's products. So you can get up and running with a software in minutes. Instead of having to sit and type in hundreds of products, you just literally modify a CSV file, do an import, and all of your inventory is there straight away. And you can get on with using the software. So that's that's part of our partnership with Inventora. Um, so, yeah. 7 p.m. next Monday, there will be a demonstration of this. And this software effectively takes care of pretty much all of the stuff I've spoken about this evening. So hopefully um, this live has been useful um, insofar as, you know, we've kind of taken you on a journey from why some of the problems that we've all faced making candles emerge and the fact that you're not alone. It's a really complicated thing running a manufacturing business irrespective of scale. And... There are certain things that you know are just for big companies, but those five things I mentioned are really, really critical. So again, click back, have a look. And if you are definitely interested, then next Monday at 7 p.m. is the next live. What I'll do now is I'll open the floor up to questions um, because you know, irrespective of what system you use, and there might be other stuff you know that you guys struggle with as you're moving from development into production. Um, so I'll take any questions. It's an open floor if, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's more on the development side, that's fine too. Um, but yeah, there you go. So anyone who's got any questions, I'll be on for the next 20 minutes or until the questions are finished. So do you know if Inventora is only finished goods inventory. Uh, no, so Inventora has um, it has raw materials and it has um, finished goods. So yeah, I kind of get where you're going with this. So I think within Inventora, I'll have to check the demo next week, but um, when I had to play around with it, you can do um, you can do production planning. So the way it works is you basically import all of your raw materials. So you start with raw materials and you can categorize them into fragrance, glass, all that kind of stuff. And then you can build products. So you build products and you state how much of each raw material was into the products. And then you can set min max levels for finished goods and for raw materials. And then you can plan production runs. Uh, the bit I'm not sure about is if you've got a planned production run, does it feed back into your inventory? What does show on the inventory screen is, um, as you've seen in the demonstration, anything that's below your minimum level turns up red. And I know if you click into the product, it does come up with all of the kind of stuff that's linked to that product, if that makes sense. So if you've got a production run planned, it will tell you. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll cover that off on the live on Monday, exactly how joined up it is. Um, it definitely allows you to um, take a look at your raw materials list. You can see everything in red means it's below the threshold that you've set. And then the way we've done the CSV import is if it's one of our products, you just go to the right, click a link, and then you can add the stuff to your cart. So it's nice and easy to turn everything red back into black. 
uh, and then hopefully Delmouth will be able to clarify. Maybe that's a, a note for Delmouth for Monday, Maya, is does Inventora link planned production inventory into your purchasing workflow or how would you manage that with an inventory? There will be a solution. These guys have been doing this for a while, so we'll, we'll cover that off on Monday. But yes, you, it tracks both minimum and maximums for finished goods and raw materials. Uh, yes, Inventora does allow you to save your recipes. Um, so what you would have with an Inventora is uh, they call them products. Uh, so when you've got a pro so what you would do is you would import all of your raw materials and let's say the example I used earlier, a 20 centiliter amber candle that would contain one amber glass. It would contain 150 grams of your chosen wax, 15 grams of fragrance. You can add all of that in uh, and it will be there forever. If you've got variations, you just create a, you can duplicate the product and then change the bill of materials. So that's the way I did it. And we'll do a demonstration of that next week was what I did was I imported one of each product size initially and I just duplicated the product and swapped the fragrance over, duplicate the product, swap the fragrance over. So it's really quite quick to build out your your products in this software. They've, they've done a wonderful job on the user interface. It works on mobile phones. It works on tablets. It works on your desktop. Uh, and there's a couple of PDFs you can get out of it. You can you can right click and take a PDF of all the stuff you need for your work order, for example. Uh, you can print out a audit audit checklist, so you can go around and count your materials from a piece of paper rather than trying to do it on your phone or something. So, so yes, it does allow you to save your recipes um, and multiple variations of recipes, should you wish. Any more questions or are we all done here? Okay, it looks like that might be us. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, right, I'll sum up. So thanks for joining us this evening. I hope that was useful. Uh, the live will be recorded. So if there's bits you want to go back and look at again, uh, feel free to do so. And if you do have any questions, drop them into Facebook after, after the live, if they come to mind, uh, and we'll do our best to get back and answer them. Okay, thanks very much, guys.